when our sun dies, it's going to blow it up as a red giant and then collapse down and become a white dwarf star, essentially the exposed core of the furnace of the sun. And as you can probably imagine, that process is going to be mayhem for any of the planets. Venus be eaten, Mercury be eaten, Earth might be eaten. And yet the changing gravity of the star will cause planets to shift around, crash into each other, crash into the star, be spun out of the system. But after that, things will settle down again. The star will cool down to the background temperature of the universe. It will take billions, even trillions of years for this to happen. And it might be a chance for second life in the solar system. Is it possible? We don't know. But of course, the field of exoplanet research is looking for planets around white dwarf stars to try and get a sense of what it's going to be like. My guest today is Professor Andrew Vanderberg, who is a researcher at MIT, specializes in white dwarfs, exoplanets, has written a bunch of his own papers, but also consults with a large group of students working on their own papers about this very subject, including some really clever ways to potentially find planets orbiting around white dwarf stars. It's a fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy. Well, hi, Andrew. It's great to talk to you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I mean, exoplanets are all in the news. But this, this concept that I've been kind of obsessing about fairly recently is is this idea of what happens to exoplanets that end up too close to a white dwarf. Can you sort of give us sort of what is the thinking right now of, of, of what people are finding? Yeah, I can give it a shot. So when a star like our sun runs out of nuclear fuel, it won't explode like more massive stars will, but it will puff up and it will expand into a red giant that is something like 200 times the size of the sun today. That's bad news for the inner solar system because Mercury is going to be engulfed. Venus is going to be engulfed. Earth may or may not be engulfed, but either way, it's going to be in a bad place because if it does survive being engulfed, it'll be roasted. But the planets in the outer solar system presumably should still be okay. They should still exist. They shouldn't be, uh, you know, roasted too badly and they shouldn't be uh, obliterated by, for example, a supernova explosion. So we expect that after the red giant phase ends, when that happens, the outer layers of the star get shot off into space. They produce these beautiful planetary nebula that you've seen images of with the Hubble telescope, uh, and now I guess the JWST. Uh, and they uh, reveal the core of the star, which is a very hot, uh, degenerate, inert core of material that's no longer fusing any elements into heavier elements and that will eventually cool down and become a white dwarf so the process of losing the outer layers of the star is fairly gentle and it should leave the outer solar system intact around the white dwarf but there's a few things that start to happen the first thing is that when the outer layers of the star are shed off that changes the mass of the star and that, through Kepler's laws, changes the way the stars orbit. So if you have a planet that used to orbit um, at a certain distance, that orbit will move outwards. And because of this, all of these orbits reshuffling, planets that could coexist peacefully for billions of years while the star was in its main sequence phase, while it was burning hydrogen into helium, all of a sudden, they may not coexist anymore. The gravity of the star is weaker because the mass is lower. And all of a sudden, that means that the planet's gravity in comparison to that of the star is larger. So the planets can start tugging each other around in ways that were never happening before. So that could introduce instabilities and cause some planets to get shot outwards, some planets to get shot inwards. And we actually see evidence of this in the spectra of white dwarfs. So if you take a spectrograph and you look at how much light there is from the white dwarfs in many different colors, you will see evidence of planetary material that has been shot inwards, crushed and torn apart by the strong right. tidal gravity of the white dwarf and then accreted onto its surface. 
So we've seen evidence for this. It's actually fairly common. We see this in about 25 to 50% of all white dwarfs. And wow. that is, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing that yeah. this is just constantly stuff is raining in from the outer solar system. So one of the big questions that I've had is how big can the planets be and can the planets ever survive that journey? So we found evidence that maybe they actually can when we discovered this planet called WD 1856 plus 534b around a white dwarf. Uh, the name of the white dwarf is WD 1856 plus 534. It's a typical astronomy phone number type name. Yeah. Uh, I'll just call it WD 1856 for short. Um, and around this white dwarf, we found a Jupiter-sized object that is going around it every 1.4 days. So for context, that's really, really close in. That's much closer than the orbit of Mercury is in that's our solar system. like closer than many hot Jupiters. Exactly. Yeah. It's one of the short, it's on the shorter period end of the hot Jupiter distribution. But this is not your typical hot Jupiter. It's actually a very cold Jupiter because the white dwarf is so old and has radiated away so much of the residual heat from the nuclear fusion of the star that its temperature, its equilibrium temperature is something like 165 Kelvin. So much cooler than the Earth, cooler than Mars, probably an equilibrium temperature a bit higher than that of Jupiter in our own solar system. So despite being in the orbit of a hot Jupiter, it's actually most likely a very cold object. Hmm. That's interesting. So like when the the white dwarf, like when the star dies, mm -hmm. as you said, it, it kind of reveals the core. And it it's such a, a like the concept is so evocative for me that you've got this star and you've got these zones, the core, you've got the radiative zone, the convective zone. And through this process of becoming a red giant, it's blasting out all of these these outer layers. And what's left is like the furnace that is now starts to, to cool down. But like, what kind of temperature are we looking at for this exposed core? And but then how much energy is actually falling on a planet that's orbiting nearby? Yeah, that's a great question. And long story short, it depends when you look at it. Right after the red giant loses its outer layers, you have this brief period where the core is hundreds of thousands of degrees Kelvin. Wow. And it's producing so much ultraviolet light that it might be essentially desiccating the entire outer solar system, blasting off all of the water due to the extreme ultraviolet radiation it's producing. But because it's producing so much, it, because it's so hot, it's producing tons and tons of light that radiates away the heat very quickly. So it cools down very rapidly on time scales, you know, of, you know, tens of thousands of years even to get down to temperatures below 100 uh, 100,000 kelvin. Right, nearly 100,000 kelvin. Nearly 100,000. Yeah, exactly. So after a few million years, you're talking about temperatures uh that are not that out of the question for stars and, you know, normal main sequence stars. So something like, you know, 10,000 to 20,000 kelvin. Now, WD1856 is a particularly old white dwarf. Its uh, temperature is lower than that of our sun. It's about 4,900 Kelvin. And if you work backwards from how uh, hot it is, you can figure out that it has probably been cooling down for something like 6 billion years. So this object has been hmm. a white dwarf for longer than our sun has existed, which is pretty mind boggling. Yeah. It had a but, whole previous and, life before that. Right, right. Much closer to the the beginning of the universe mm -hmm. and and yet even though it's been dead for as long as the sun has been around it's still relatively bright mm -hmm. so you know the evidence of this planet i mean this is not the shattered remnants of planets that crashed into each other this is not planets that deposited into the upper atmosphere of this white dwarf like this is these are actual planets orbiting around this star and as you say, the the amount of temperature, the amount of heat that's falling on this is, I mean, is reasonable. It's yeah. kind of amazing. 
Yeah, this is an intact planet as far as we can tell. We've seen yeah. ones that are not, and it behaves very differently from this. This one, as far as we can tell, is just a well-behaved, normal Jupiter that's in a really weird place. Now, there was a, a paper that came out just a couple of days ago about astronomers finding both interplanet debris, but also Kuiper Belt debris around a white dwarf. So this this process of changing the size and scale and amount of mass, therefore the gravity and the, all these interactions, it sounds like it's like a whole other late heavy bombardment period throughout the entire solar system. That's exactly right. It essentially resets the dynamical state of the system to be much more like at the very beginning of our own solar system when all of these uh, unstable orbits were just being shown to be unstable and then causing stuff to fly inwards all the time. Although one of the interesting results that we don't really understand is that as time goes on, you still see quite a bit of pollution. So even if you look at these older white dwarfs, you see evidence of stuff accreting onto them, even billions of years after it became a white dwarf. So there must be some mechanism to keep the bombardment coming maybe more so even than it did before uh, it became a white dwarf in its previous life. Hmm. So like whatever this process is, is ongoing for, but billions of years, like it just keeps going. Yeah. Huh. I wonder, what do you think would be able to maintain that kind of chaos for such a long period of time? Yeah, so one idea that I think is really cool uh, is by Dimitri Veras. So what he wondered is whether galactic tides can be something that causes this pollution to keep going even after billions of years. So the idea is that you have a companion, a binary star far away, and the binary star will interact with the material in the you know post-planetary system on relatively short time scales. Uh, you know, millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. But you can actually get long-term variations in the orbit of the binary star due to the uh, gravity from the center of our galaxy and the uh, essentially the you know difference in the uh, rotation rate on the far side of the system to the near side of the system. And that will affect the orbit on time scales of billions of years if you have the right orientation. So maybe hmm. what's happening is you get these long period changes as a result of these galactic tides that then essentially perturb another batch of planetary material close into the system uh, in a way that wasn't happening before. Now, one obviously very interesting aspect of this is that if we are getting these planets getting close to the star again, and the temperatures are reasonable, there's got to be a habitable zone around the white dwarf. How would a habitable zone around a white dwarf compare to, say, a habitable zone around a more familiar star like the sun? Yeah, that's a great point. So the biggest difference, of course, is that the habitable zone is going to be really, really close in. I'm sure you've thought about the habitable zones around M dwarfs, which are much closer than the habitable zones around the sun. This is going to be even closer in than that. Hmm. So it turns out that for WD 1856, at its 1.4 day orbital period, it's actually outside of the habitable zone, but not a huge distance outside. It's pretty close. So about you know a few billion years ago, it would have been in the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that happens is that the habitable zone moves inwards as the white dwarf cools down because the white dwarf is not producing as much heat, uh, as, as much warming radiation. So your habitable zone is almost a moving target. You want to find yourself, park yourself really close in. And then at that point, when the white dwarf is cooling down very slowly, you'll have the longest period of time remaining in the habitable zone. Do you think there's a sweet spot where you could be in that for billions of years, maybe even trillions of years? Because like I know it takes a long time for these stars to finally cool down to the background temperature of the universe. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the sweet spot is somewhere between when it's cooling down slow enough that you remain in there for billions of years but not so cold that you have to get close enough that your planet is going to be tidally disrupted. 
Right. So at some point, the inner edge of the habitable zone is not because it's too hot, but because if you were orbiting there, your planet would be pulled apart and therefore you can't be there. So that will eventually put a limit on how close you can get and how much of the warmth uh, for these very, very cool white dwarfs you can get. But you should have billions of years in the habitable zone before you get there, longer than Earth will remain in the habitable zone uh, around the sun. But almost like the opposite problem, while the <clears throat> the sun is slowly heating up and cooking the Earth over the next 500 million to a billion years, the white dwarf is going to be slowly cooling down and freezing your planet. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the, you know, a lot of emphasis is on these red dwarfs because they're a lot less bright than a star like the sun, a lot easier to find exoplanets orbiting around them. Mm -hmm. With a white dwarf, you again have a star that is not that bright. How how would it compare to searching for exoplanets and maybe even trying to scan for the kinds of atmospheric components that we would find that would tell us there might be life there? Favorably. So we often talk about the small star advantage that M dwarfs have, which is that the smaller the star compared to its planet, the bigger the signal of the atmosphere will be. And because white dwarfs are much smaller than M dwarfs even, that's boosted for white dwarfs. So think about how large uh, the signal of a transiting Earth is around these different types of stars. Around the sun, it's about 100 parts per million, or about 1% of 1%. Around the smallest M dwarfs, it's about 1%, so a factor of 100 times larger. And around a white dwarf, it can be 50% of the blight of the white dwarf. So hmm. it just completely blows it away in terms of... Uh, the amount of transit depth. Uh, working with a group of astronomers at Cornell, Lisa Kaltenegger and Ryan McDonald, we actually calculated if there were an Earth-sized planet orbiting around WD 1856, which there's not, uh, but if it happened to be there, or if there was an Earth-sized planet around a similarly distant, similar white dwarf in the habitable zone, how long would we need to actually measure the atmosphere? And what we found is that you would really only need about 25 hours of James Webb time to do that. And amazingly, the amount of time that you actually need is really more like a couple of hours. The only reason you need to ask for 25 hours is because you have to time the time very precisely. So if you yeah, the way the way James Webb proposals work is that if you want to time your visit to within a few minutes, you have to put an hour of padding on either side. So most of that time is essentially uh, just that pad. If you could perfectly time everything, you could probably find biosignatures in about three hours if such a planet were to be found. Wow. So then in terms of candidates, I mean, you know, TESS is always mm -hmm. described as the finder scope for JWST. Do you have a bunch of candidate stars in TESS or in other catalogs that you think would be these ideal candidates to stare at with JWST? Uh, yeah, we just need to find planets around them. So we have TESS proposals uh, accepted to do exactly that. What we want to do is look with TESS's new rapid data mode. TESS takes data uh, at many different uh, frequencies. So how often does it take a measurement of the brightness of the star? And because white dwarfs are so small, if you have something going in front of them and you blink, you miss it. So you need your data to be taken very quickly. So recently, there was a new 20-second data mode that was introduced for TESS. And we're trying to use this new 20-second data mode to try to find these planets around white dwarfs. Um, if we can, then hopefully we'll be able to see if they have anything interesting in their atmospheres with JWST. Uh, so far, no good candidates yet, but we've looked at um, you know a few thousand, and there's many more to come. So keep your you know fingers crossed that nature is kind to us, and that these planets are common enough that we'll find one within essentially Tess's horizon for searching for these objects. I mean, do you think, like I know before TESS launched, astronomers were making a bunch of estimates on how many Earth-sized planets it should probably find, how many of super Earths and mini Neptunes and so on. Do you have an, an idea of how common you think these things are? Or is it still like you just, you don't even have, you can't even start the sample size? Yeah, 
I have feelings, but that's all they are. <laughs> right. So we've we found one planet, uh, one planet candidate, which I feel pretty confident is really a planet, but I'll wait until JWST observes it in June to, you know, tell me for sure. Next June. And that's a Jupiter size. Yeah, next June. Right. And that should tell us pretty conclusively that the mass is either smaller than, you know, 12 Jupiter masses, which is where you roughly have the cutoff between a white, a brown dwarf and a planet. Or it'll tell us that the mass is actually pretty close to that cutoff, and maybe we still have some uncertainty. Um, but by next June, we should have the data to answer that question. Um, so we know there's one giant planet. We have looked at you know several thousand white dwarfs with the sensitivity to find that giant planet. So what does that tell us? Is it strange that we found a giant planet first, or should we have expected that? And when we first found it, I was a little bit nervous. Why did we find this giant planet first? We think that Earth-sized planets should create as big of a signal as giant planets, just because once you have a planet that's the size of your star, everything's going to cause a very big dip in brightness. So it shouldn't be easier to find a giant planet than an Earth-sized planet, or not that much easier, at least. Um, but what I realized then is that the giant planets have an advantage, is that they're more likely to actually transit, because the giant planet is bigger. So if the giant planet you know, comes across like this, it'll block all of the light. If it comes across like this, it'll block all of the light, whereas an Earth-sized planet has to be more precisely aligned. And that's not something we think about in main sequence stars. So we can't really use the fact that we haven't found an Earth-sized planet yet to say anything about how common they may be. All we know is that they may not be as likely to transit as the giant planets. So if we have one giant planet in a few thousand, then maybe we have a similar number of Earths, but we just haven't looked at enough stars yet. But you're focusing on the transit method, which is only one of the many ways to to look for planets. Mm -hmm. And I know that, say, Gaia has done incredible work in locating tons and tons of white dwarfs. Mm -hmm. um, and Gaia is has the potential to be a planet hunter on its own through astrometry. Yeah. How would that technique work for searching for planets would the mass of the of the planet and how close it is to the white dwarf give you a much better shot at detecting planets around it yeah so Gaia is most sensitive to massive planets and it's most sensitive to far out planets so it may find the jupiters that remain around white dwarfs it may find even some really massive things that are close in it probably won't find Earths that are close in so if you're looking for habitability you won't be looking for Gaia detections but it certainly is going to tell us a lot about the planetary systems around white dwarfs. So I'm super excited about that. And then the other method, of course, is direct imaging. And mm -hmm. with the Earth-sized world around the sun-like star, you've got this factor where it's, what is it, 10 million to one mm -hmm. brightness mm -hmm. from the star to the planet. What is the factor of brightness of the star to the planet in the case of a white dwarf with a planet orbiting around it? It will be fairly similar. Uh, oh, really? It, okay. Yeah. Because like 10,000, I think it's like 10,000 to one with an M dwarf and it's, and it's, yeah. and that's within the regime that JWST can, can observe. Yeah. So let me, it's a let white me check, think if this is true. I think that the contrast is really only a function of um, the temperature of the star because it's mm -hmm. in reflected light, right? So if you're at some distance uh, from the star at the correct distance to have a habitable uh, temperature, then you're going to be receiving the same amount of reflected light from the star. Uh, so I think in reflected light, it's the same contrast. In thermal right. light, it may be much more doable. I don't actually have those numbers on yeah. my head. But it, but, it's, but it sounds like then, the transit method is the most feasible method to find them, but it's really so tricky because the white dwarf star is tiny compared to to a traditional star. And so the chances of you getting these to line up perfectly is incredibly low. And yeah. So Until you think about, 
Yeah, until you think about the recent paper by Marianne Limbach, where she was describing how we might search using JWST looking for the thermal emission from the white dwarf. So how would that work? So essentially there, what you do is you look for objects that are very, very close, essentially blended with the white dwarf star. And you look for the infrared glow of the planet. And because the uh, planet in thermal light is uh, so much brighter typically than uh, in comparison to the white dwarf than it would be around a main sequence star, you can actually see that peaking out. So there's the answer to your question that you probably were trying to lead me to before, <laughs> um, is that the thermal contrast is much greater and that the uh, reflected light contrast is about the same. Um, and so with, for example, a very powerful infrared telescope equipped with a coronagraph, like GWST, uh, don't even worry about the shot. coronagraph. If you use a coronagraph, you're going to miss all the habitable planets because mm. they're going to be so close in that you won't be able to image them. So you have to look for them in blended light. The coronagraph will let you find even fainter objects very far away, like your Jupiters, um, and that'll be great. But for the habitable ones, you want to be looking just in totally blended light. So don't even turn your chronograph on. Right. Leave it off. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, this sounds like a really tricky, like it's, a, it's an exciting possibility, especially if you can find it, but it sounds like a really tricky problem to find these things. So if you were to kind of go back and, and design a mission, design a spacecraft, design an experiment to find planets around white dwarves, what would that mission look like? I think it would look a lot like um, the LSST survey that's coming up. Um, the and Vera Rubin even, Observatory. The Vera Rubin Observatory, yeah. yeah, formerly known as LSST, which I guess they, technically the survey is still LSST. Yeah. When, yeah, an aside, they announced that they were renaming the W First Mission Roman and the LSST telescope Rubin uh, about you know two weeks apart, and their names are so similar that I always <laughs> have to take a half second before I figure out which one is which. Right. Uh, so I usually just keep saying LSST so I don't have to <laughs> worry about that. Um, yeah, so if you're trying to find a planet with transits, then you would want a uh, mission very similar to Rubin. It doesn't need to have high photometric precision because you have very deep transits, much deeper than the typical uh, atmospheric limitations on the photometric precision. So you don't need to worry even about being in space. But if you want to find the biosignatures, then you need to be in the infrared. And you'd really want something that looks a lot like JWST. Uh, if you, you know, really wanted to optimize it, you could make requirements such that you can measure the brightness of a star, you know, in different uh, wavelength bands to very, very high absolute precision. So mm -hmm. in transits, we often think about relative precision. So the measurement, you know, the previous measurement compared to the next one and how close those are. But to do this, you need to know absolute precision. So exactly how bright is the white dwarf at this wavelength and exactly how bright is it at this wavelength? And we then compare those to our models of what the white dwarf should look like and see if there's any extra uh, infrared light coming from a planet. So that's the big challenge with the, um, the blended light is you have to really know how bright your white dwarf must be and you have to really know your instrument calibration. So JWC is going to be good at that, but this may be pushing it a little bit. Right. So so if I get this right, you're asking for a space-based Vera Rubin that can observe in many wavelengths simultaneously looking for brightness so that you can compare them at the same scale, but maybe more would, powerful than JWST. Is that, is I, that? I think I would want two different telescopes, I guess. Uh, okay. All I kind of right. tricked you there uh, and you know changed up what I was saying. So I want one telescope that's like Vera Rubin. It doesn't even need to be in space. It could just be on the ground, but able to you know observe two hemispheres. So maybe Vera Rubin in the north, Vera Rubin in the south. Then you can observe all the white dwarfs. Uh, then simultaneously, I want a space telescope to do the infrared search uh, as proposed by Marianne Blimbach and try to find these white dwarfs with a tiny little bit of extra infrared flux to keep them, you know, to show that there's a planet there. Right. And for that one, you want it to be able to observe very 
precisely uh, and accurately uh, the photometry, the brightness of the star in these different wavelength bands and have that you know calibration just rock solid so that you can get these little teeny tiny differences between what you expect and what you actually see. Okay. All right. That, that sounds perfectly reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> JMC is so very close to that. So I'm not complaining and yeah, very happy yeah. that it's working so well. Yeah, but it is interesting, like when there are these specific questions that people are trying to ask, you can actually then strip back the the instrument back to a more basic version, but and then you can maximize that specific capability. But I do like the idea of a space based Vera Rubin. So I'm going to I'm going to leave that on the, you know, in the, in, in my decadal survey. Um, so this, this idea of, of biosignatures, I mean, you know, here on earth, wherever we find water, we find life mm -hmm. and life can seem to adapt to really extreme circumstances. And so can you envision a planet going through all of these stages from the early late heavy bombardment to the sun heating up to the red giant phase to the horrible chaos to everything shrinking back down and the star cooling back down? Does it feel feasible that that life could survive that journey? I don't think life could survive it. I think you would have to be thinking about a second genesis in the system. So you would have your first generation life that might exist in a Earth-like tr traditional habitable zone. And then maybe you would have far out in the solar system, something like Enceladus or you know a moon of Jupiter or a rocky planet far out in the solar system. We don't have any of those in our solar system, but maybe they exist in others. Um, Earth, I'm assuming, is going to be toast. That's not going to be a great place to have life uh, after you know the red giant uh, expanse. But these icy moons in the outer solar system, if they can hold on to their water, then they might have a shot of a future in the inner solar system. So what I imagine then is a moon gets liberated from its planet, perhaps due to some of these dynamical interactions, and it gets scattered into a very high eccentricity orbit where it gets so close to the white dwarf that it's stretched a little bit by the tides, by the gravity of the white dwarf, and that dissipates the orbital energy. So it eventually kind of spirals inwards and comes into a close in orbit, perhaps near where WD-1856 is in the habitable zone. Now, the challenge with that is you have to dissipate a lot of energy in order to get the planet from out there to in here. And where's that energy gonna go? almost certainly it's gonna to go to heating up the planet, which means that you're going to essentially melt the core of your planet. And it's probably not gonna be a hospitable place for life as well during that period or for a long time afterwards. But if you get your planet down there, which is presumably devoid of life after that process, and you have a, you know, a rocky planet in a habitable zone environment, uh, and it still has held on to some of its water, or maybe water comes in in the second light heavy bombardment, as we were talking about, then you could imagine that you have fairly similar conditions to early Earth, where you might have uh, a second genesis of life. Now, whether that can actually happen is a different question. <laughs> One of the key differences between a white dwarf environment, radiation environment, and a sun-like radiation environment is that white dwarfs, after they cool down, have much less UV radiation. And there's some belief that UV radiation is really important for provoking the interesting chemistry needed for life to arise. So if that's true, then maybe it's a bad idea to go and try to do this around a white dwarf because there's just no UV radiation to speak of. On the other hand, if you want your life to arise near, you know, a thermal vent in the deep ocean, this is probably a pretty good place to do it because we just melted the core of our planet again. So <laughs> there's going to be geological activity and presumably right. a lot of geothermal heat that could cause that kind of thing. So I'd say we just don't know enough about the origin of life on Earth to say whether or not it's likely to happen around a white dwarf. I think my takeaway is that there's like a lot of stuff that has to go right, but it's not out of the question, um, which is yeah, not a terrible outcome in my mind. It's a big Maybe, universe. Yeah, there's a big universe. You got lots of chances for everything to go right. Yeah.
Yeah, well, Andrew, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, if people want to keep track of your work, what's the best place to do that? Uh, you can uh, follow me on Twitter. I tweet my papers from my group led by students uh, pretty much exclusively. You can check out my webpage, which is, uh, you know, I guess you can put a link on this video. Mm -hmm. uh, and I periodically update the research that we've been working on. And you can follow my students on Twitter uh, who all have, you know, really amazing projects and who are working on all sorts of different things, including white dwarfs, including main sequence exoplanets, trying to understand what exo uh, extrasolar geology is like so just the you know a broad range of interesting planet related topics and hopefully we'll figure out what planets are like throughout our galaxy yeah it's an exciting exciting time to be in exoplanet research and the number is just accelerating so Absolutely. Andrew, well thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today good luck with your research if you do find a biosignature around a white dwarf please let me know will do thanks for All having right. me thank you so much you can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I read every word. There are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There, you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.